Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Wherever You Go podcast. My name is Sam Bauer, and I'm the moderator and host of this podcast. And I am so excited today to introduce my friend, um, money coach Bev. Um, Bev Miller is a uh, Dave Ramsey preferred coach for finance, finances and budgeting, um, and she helps people manage their money. Um, and it follows... Um, well, it follows Dave Ramsey's program, but um, a lot of people, I think, have misconceptions about what that actually looks like. You don't have to go out and sell all your belongings or um, like do crazy things. Um, but there's also a course that that Dave Ramsey offers like in churches called Financial Peace. And um, it, it, managing your money properly is really a biblical process. And, and it, it really does root all the way back to, you know, before Jesus was even born. So, um, Bev's going to share a little bit about that with us today. And I was lucky enough to meet Bev, like, I don't know, right after I opened my agency. I mean, probably within a couple months, which was another God thing, because um, Bev was looking for somebody who she could trust that was an insurance agent that she could um, refer her clients to. And I was super excited that you wanted to meet with me. Um, but in that first meeting, it turned into so much more than an opportunity to grow my business. Uh, Bev, like, really showed me that I didn't really know what a budget was <laughs> <laughs> and um, gave me some tips basically to get started um, in my journey as a business owner to, to make sure that my personal finances didn't like go in the crapper basically while I was getting my business started because prior to owning a business, I had a high salary position. I had credit cards. I had credit card debt that was still there when I opened my agency. And honestly, if I had uh, continued down that rabbit hole, I, I may not be here today in this. I might be back in a corporate position um, because when you open a business, you don't make money for a while. <laughs> um, so anyway, back to Bev. Um, can you introduce yourself and a little bit about your journey? Because you went from being, would you say, a molecular biologist <laughs> right. to a money coach, which like they don't even. <laughs> I know. So tell I us know. a little bit about yourself and your journey and, and what got you here. I, and actually, in hindsight, I think all the different kinds of, of work experiences have, I've had, I see now how it benefits me helping my clients because I've kind of seen and done a lot of different things but isn't that um, cool like god prepared you probably in a i didn't realize it at the time but yeah um, <laughs> so i'm almost 64 so i've had time to do that kind of stuff so i graduated from college in 1979 with a degree in biology and chemistry okay um and no idea what to do so i went to graduate school because i didn't know what else to do <laughs> I think that's common. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I mean, no internet back then to try to, you know, help you research careers and that kind of thing. But, you know, I was book smart. Um, yeah. I've always been book smart, you know, I always got the, the high grades and stuff, but I, but I never had a passion for any one field of study, but, so, well, you know, go and found out, well, you can go get a PhD for free. Nice. Um, and that's still true, you know. Um, that's the one kind of graduate school in the sciences. It's uh, they pay you, you don't pay them, and it's all funded by grant money. I didn't realize um, that. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So you know, I, I spent a year at Pitt. Didn't uh, you know, I wanted to work in a, in a uh, tumor virus lab. I wanted to hmm. cure the world of cancer, yes. which many of which are caused by viruses. And the guy that I wanted to work, whose lab I wanted to work in didn't get tenure that year. So I moved down the street to Carnegie Mellon, down the Mellon Institute, that big building with all the big pillars, you know, I think yeah. it was a movie. I used it in one of the Batman movies, I think. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I love Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I finally got my PhD in biology there. It took a long time um, because you stay until you have enough publishable research material and I was in a field that oh, wow. every experiment took three weeks instead of overnight you know right um, so 1987 I get a PhD but by then I'm like I don't want to do this for the rest of my life and be in academic research and living on grant money my whole life right uh, went to to work at um, 
uh, I ended up at a couple different companies. I what was at Allegheny General doing like kind of a postdoc, then the Fisher Scientific, and then got laid off there because they they got rid of all their whole R and D department. They got rid of that, and then I landed at Shandon, a uh, low a pathology supply company. Okay. Spent almost what was it nine or ten years there. So all through the nineties. Um, so I was in the business world then. So I've, you know, again, it's, it's like all the different kinds of experiences. I know what it means to be a professional student, <laughs> um, and in the academic world. And then I got into the business world and in R and D and then into marketing, um, got into the, at the end, um, FDA regulatory world. Okay. Um, Lost that job, won't tell that whole sad story. <laughs> <laughs> Wound up at another biotech company in, in Pittsburgh. So this whole time I was like, I, I need to stay in Pittsburgh. My husband went to work for PPG right out of college, two years ahead of me, worked there for 39 years. Okay, so he was not following the same path you were. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thankfully he was the stable, you know, when it came to income, he was the stable one. And here's yep. me going, <laughs> Um, but, uh, I didn't have the choice to, to really, you know, move to different cities and in the biotech world, I mean, the acquisitions, mergers and acquisitions in biotech are probably even worse than in the banking field. It's just constant. If you want to stay in that field, you got to be mobile. Um, I get that. so yeah, so eventually that ended too. And it was like, oh, well, now what am I going to do? I think yeah. I've run the gamut of, <laughs> of the companies in Pittsburgh. <laughs> and, by, and I was pretty much burned out. Corporate America chewed me up, spit me out. I feel you, sister. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <To me. laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember your story when you left where you were. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I was like, yeah, but what do I do? Um, and I was unemployed for a year. Okay. And um, that was one of the, whatever the economy was, I could get unemployment for a year and then it ended. But during that period, I was also um, making a little bit of money. You know, you can make some money when you're unemployed, but not a whole lot. So I was doing physical labor for a gardener. Okay. So it's kind of biology. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> plants. That's horticulture. What <laughs> pull, pulling weeds, baby. Pulling weeds. <laughs> um, but it was fun. It kept got me. Oh man, my hands would ache at the end of the day. But you know, she would give. We divide flowers in rich people's gardens, and it, I'd come home every night with divisions of of perennial flowers. So I at least said, <laughs> cool. yeah, yeah. Um, so then how did then, you get from there into money coaching? So shortly, at, so that was a year there. And then a friend of mine, uh, still good friends today through ski patrol, um, ran, I still do. I don't work for them anymore. A company that publishes maps and community guides for municipalities. Okay. And so I would work and I went to work for, for them, basically selling the advertising that pays for the publication. Okay. So I'd go and work at a municipality and then solicit all of the businesses in that municipality and around there for advertising to put on this publication that would then be mailed out to all the residents. Okay. Um, so yeah, it was kind of fun. It was, frankly, it, it was easy. Yeah. And. I mean, I only worked probably 20 hours a week. Okay. Um, and completely independent. So that was my first work as independent contractor. Okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I work when I want, as long as I want, as hard as I want, or as not yeah. hard as I want. So you got the taste for working for yourself, kind of. <laughs> and I found out I like not working 40, 50, 60 hours a week. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, and that's, I did that for quite a while, but during that time was when I discovered Dave Ramsey on the radio. Okay. Cause I spent, cause doing that job, I was in, You're in the car, car all the time. That's, we were just talking time. like, that's when I listen to podcasts. Cause I'm in yep. the car as well. And that's, 
that's when we do yeah, it. Yeah, so this is in the early 2000s before podcasts and all that. But, you know, on the radio, I was like, who's this guy? Yeah. And boy, he's funny and, and he's interesting and he helps people. And boy, the stuff he teaches, we mostly had been doing. Um, like we never really had any consumer debt. We never had credit card debt. Um, occasionally we had a car loan, but we'd pay it off in like six months. Okay. Wow. And then we always paid extra on our mortgage and we had, so I discovered him in like 2004, I think it was, we had paid when I got laid off from my final corporate job. Yeah. We, we took the little bit of severance pay that I got and we paid off our mortgage. So we paid off a 30 year mortgage in 12 years. That's awesome. So do you think because we're in slightly different generations, right? You're right ahead of me. Now I'm a boomer. I feel like in my generation, like that is not common. I barely come across anybody in, in my profession, and I insure a lot of homes um, that are in that situation where they, you know, have no debt, paid off their houses, pay off their cars. Um, why do you think, like, is are things just more expensive now? Or do people just don't? People don't know. They don't. No, I don't. I don't think it's really any different. I mean, our first, um, not first home, um, second home. My husband bought a little, a little fifteen thousand dollar house when he graduated, a year after he graduated from college. Before we got married, then yeah. when my grandmother died in nineteen eighty, we bought her home from the estate. Okay. And we were so thrilled because we got a 14% mortgage instead of 18%. Wow. Isn't that insane? Yeah. So <laughs> no, it's, and, and now you know, there's a lot right more there. incentive there to pay it off though, too. Like, I well, that's not the one we, we lived there. We didn't pay that off. Um, I don't remember that's back then John was doing all the finances. <laughs> that's, that's, that's Actually, I took it over <laughs> because it, his organization leaves something to be desired. And, and one, I remember one time it's like, oh, we got a late, he didn't pay the mortgage on time. We got a thing in the mail. I, I just flipped out. I'm like, that's hilarious. Cause that's we it. have the same, oh. yeah. Same oh, thing the bill. My, yep. we, I can't like, I don't know how he lets me do it, but I can't let him do it. Like it's not that he's not capable. <laughs> it's that like that happened. We got one late payment one time. And I grant it, sometimes we get them late when I'm paying it, but it's okay. Cause I know it's being paid, <laughs> but yeah, same thing. Like I, so now. I yeah. I just, I was oblivious and then I started taking it over and I, I guess I wasn't still, I wasn't nearly as organized as I, as I am now. We didn't live on a budget. That's one of the big things that yeah. uh, finally learned how to do. And, and I, relate to people who struggle to get that started because I remember you know knowing how knowing what a budget is and how to do it up here is one thing but actually carrying it out it's so hard like yeah. I when I met with you I mean I'll never forget that day because you left and my mind was blown <laughs> this whole time I thought because I knew how much money I made and I knew how much we were spending that we were budgeting and come to find out not so much. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's normal. Hard, and, that's yeah, so and, and normal. I'll say in the last two years, we've we've done it really well and we've done it really bad. And we've got on the wagon and off the wagon and we hate it. We hate it. <laughs> but it's so liberating to when we have it, life is better. As much as we are like, oh, we have $40 left in the eating out budget. So we can get pizza like one more time this month. Like it's annoying and, and wonderful at the same time right? Because you know how much money you have, and then you can be smart about how you use those $40. Right. So it I, I, re I remember like, early on when we were budgeting, and it was still with me, you know, John, he, I mean, he, to this day, I mean, he, yeah, he, he puts his receipts in, and he looks at it, but I'm the nerd, right? <laughs> so if I don't do it, if I don't create the new budget, it ain't happening. Yes. So, so, but one time I, there was life got busy and I don't remember what was going on, but there was like two months in a row where it's like, I just don't have time for this. Yeah. But by the third month I was like, oh my gosh, I got to get back to budgeting. 
this yep. panic feeling I'm feeling all the time. I finally, that's why, because yep. I haven't been doing the budget. And I've went back to it. I've never, never yep. stopped ever since. We realized that, well, I realized, I don't know if Rob's had any like revelations through this. Um, I don't know what she called process. Um, but I thought that I was the one that was really good with money. It's not the case. So <laughs> I am good at paying the bills and I'm good at managing the, like putting the budget together. I hate following it. He is amazing at it. Like he, so we actually, at one point in time, he had to go do the grocery shopping because he followed the budget. He, we made a list, he'd buy what was on the list and bring it home where I would go and be like, oh, but the kids really like this snack. So I'm going to grab that. Or like, I have no control when it comes to my children. <laughs> and so that's been eye-opening for me. Cause I always kind of, I mean, maybe I have like a something wrong with my ego, but like, I thought I was pretty good at all this. And then we started following this plan and I realized I need him to be a part of this because he holds me accountable and he's much better at like, I give him, and maybe it's, maybe that's like the difference between like the entrepreneur and the non-entrepreneur, but like, I do what I want. <laughs> he, <laughs> I can give him a list. Spirit. He, he's really more nerdy than you. Yeah. He'll follow that list to a T. So maybe he should be the one paying the bills. But. Well, that's what, but uh, another Dave Ramseyism is it's like, if, if two people, if two people are just the same, get married. One of them's one of them's not necessary or something. You know, God puts you together for a reason because you complement each other. Yeah, yeah, and we are pretty much opposites. But yeah, on this on this one, I definitely thought like I've always I've always been independent. I've always made my own money. I've always that was the other flip for us too. Was that he went back to work when I opened my agency? So now it was, it, and it's our money, but it he was making it now, and so I had always been the breadwinner. Like, and so that was also a big switch for me because I went from, well, I earned the money and there's, you know, there's but some in there, like I'll spend it how I, and now I'm like calling him, you know, Hey, can I, so it's, it's been a, a great relationship building exercise. Um, it makes you me, realize but, that it's not your money and his money. It's our, all of it is our money. Yeah. 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 And I've, I, I still struggle. You know, there are days where I call this my business. It's not my business. It's our business. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Cause you, you couldn't do it without him. So no, no. And he'll be here. So, I mean, he's putting in the time with his salary position until we get to the point where he can join and then we'll both be here. So oh, cool. That'll be great. Yeah. <laughs> so the sacrifices he's making are truly the reason that my doors are open. Cause he's gone. He's driving truck, right? He is, he's home every night, but he does work long, like he 10, 12 hour days. So it's I feel like a single mother, a lot of times <laughs> and he's sacri he went from a stay at home dad to doing that. So he's sacrificed a lot of time with the kids that he cherished. Um, yeah. so we're August, 2022 is our goal. So we're awesome. working really hard to make that happen. I think we're, I think we're in the home stretch, but anyway, um, I digress. Um, so I was hoping that you could share with us a little bit um, about what the Bible says about money, because there's a lot of like pre like, again, I talked about this last week um, in my podcast a lot that like the people take things out of the Bible out of context and they like to spread that around. And yep. um, I think money is a huge area where you might hear things. Um, and I think the, the one I had, um, sent you in the email was I, you know, it, it says in the Bible that for a rich person to get into heaven, it's like having, having to squeeze them through it at the head of a needle. So right. if we do all the right things financially and we don't have any debt and we become a millionaire, how are we going to get into heaven? <laughs> Cause I'm not fitting through the head of a needle. Like, it's just not going to happen. Well, a camel and you're a lot smaller than the camel. It's like the camel through the eye of the needle. Yeah. <laughs> got it. Got it. <laughs> yeah. So I love what you said. Um, so, you know, writing some notes down um, before this and things I want to make sure I say. And, and at the top of my list is never read a Bible verse. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever hear that? Yes. I, as soon as I heard that, like, and you think about it. Like, and it basically means never read a single Bible verse. In other words, you will take it out of context and use it the wrong way. Yes. Yes. So. And that's one of my biggest fears in this podcast. Cause 
like we said, I'm not a theologian. Like I'm not that. So when I pick out verses, I read the whole, I almost, I almost named this podcast after the Proverbs 31 woman. And then I read that whole thing again. And I was like, that's, that's intimidating. <laughs> I don't want people to feel like they have to be that woman. Cause there's a lot more than she's clothed with strength and dignity. She's also like superwoman, And I didn't want yeah. that to be what the expectation is. Right. Listening. So anyway, like that's, I love that. Don't read just a verse. Read. So yeah, the point is, well, yeah, but what comes next? And, and that story is particularly good for that. But um, just, I want to, I want to make sure people keep the big picture. Christianity is the only religion that your salvation's not based on what you do. Okay just go back to the heart of the gospel jesus did everything that was needed what we do i'm going to say it doesn't matter but our salvation doesn't depend on our performance here yep and this story i think one of the points of that story is he's basically proving that to them um and so yeah you know, I, I got it up so as, in case people don't know so as he was setting out on his journey a man ran up and knelt before him and, and asked him good teacher what must i do to inherit eternal life and jesus said to him why do you call me good no one is good except god alone you know the commandments do not murder blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm gonna jump through he lists all the commandments and he's, the guy says yeah but i've done all that um so um Jesus looked at him and said, well, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. So the guy had, he knew, he, he knew he lacked something. He had that sense or he wouldn't have asked, but he was doing his best to be, to, to perform and follow, follow the commandments. Yep. Um, and it wasn't his one stumbling block was his wealth. And that's kind of the, the whole overarching message about money in the Bible is money's not evil, but it can be a big stumbling block and a big obstacle between you and God. <clears throat> um, but then Jesus goes on after he goes away. He's, he's saying to the disciples, how difficult is it for, for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were saying, well, um, well then who can be saved? Um, he, I'm sorry, I, I'm jumping ahead. That's when he says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And that's what's always quoted and alone. And yep. that's just like, well, if you're rich, you can't go to heaven. Yep, money is whoa, 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 whoa. But the very <laughs> next thing he says, you know, the disciples said, well, then who can be saved? Jesus says, well, with man, it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Yep. Well, in other words, you can't make it happen. God makes it happen. Yep. Okay. But yeah, it's it, wealth and money can be such an obstacle to, that gets between us and God and becomes an idol where we start worshiping money instead of worshiping God. Yep. Um, that's, that's kind of the point. And that's why there's like 2,250, depending on what you count as, as um, being about money, but passages in the Bible about money. Yep. Uh, and money and possessions yeah more than any other topic yeah because god knew this is going to be a problem for you right um but he knows us he knows our hearts and that's why he sent jesus yep so again yep. to like the number so, of yeah, multitude the of sins is, <laughs> don't forget the big picture jesus did it all okay yep and how much money you have doesn't determine whether you go to heaven or not okay yep. but you need to watch your it's not money it's your attitude towards money 
Yes. That's, that's the problem. Um, you know, another one that's taken out of context all the time is, is people will say, well, money is the root of all evil. No, that's not what the Bible says. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. Yep. And that's basically, yeah, you turn money into an idol. And whether you turn money into an idol or not is not dependent on how much of it you have. Some of the poorest people idolize money far more than, than the wealthy. Yeah, and that's where debt happens, right? Because they don't have the money to spend, so they put it on credit cards. Yep, and it's not the money, you know, the money or what money can buy, the material right. things. Yeah, um, and you know they'll spend all their money on lottery tickets, or you know, it's it's all about how can I get more. Yeah, that's their whole focus, and and that's not a slam on the poor. It's it just we all have those tendencies. Right. And it's easy for people to say, well, well, of course, you don't think that, well, you got money, but we all are, are, are um, subject to, to, you know, that kind of thinking. Right. Um, but money itself is not moral or immoral. Money yeah. is an inanimate object. It's amoral. Yep. It doesn't have morals. You can use money to do incredible good or you can use it to do incredible evil yep. you can like dave ramsey so you can throw it throw a brick you, money's like a brick you can take a brick and throw it through somebody's window or you can take that brick and you can build a hospital ah i love that so um that's why um it, it, it's just there's so many ways in which it kind of gets in our way and becomes an idol and gets between us and God. Yeah. Um, and what does the Bible say about um, what we should do, like with our money or how we should manage our money? Are there with all those, would you say 200 some mentions of money um, and all the guidelines that God does give us about life? I'm sure there's something there about um, I know in Proverbs, I think there's quite a few different things about build your business before you build your home. And, Our you know. buddy Dave likes to say, if you read the book of Proverbs over and over and over again, you'll end up with a, with a master's degree in finance. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that because there are, there's so, just even off the top, I didn't, I didn't Google or like look through, I didn't look through the Bible um, to those verses, but just off the top of my head, I can think of like five or six different ones that well, I have, and I'm actually, I could share this with, if I could share, can I share my screen? I can show you. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, make me a co-host, go into participants. And next to my name, click more and make me a co-host. There you go. Okay. So this is a document that I use with um, when I'm first starting out a new client. Okay. So I usually work with clients for a period of six months. So at our first meeting, I kind of go through general principles, um, particularly if, if they are Christians. Um, but, and then if anybody wants this, you know, feel free to contact me, I'll send it to you. Okay, but, I'll I post mean, your um, contact info in the when I post this one. It's going to be yeah. the first live. Um, so these <laughs> are just kind of the general principles that underlie what I teach as a, as a coach, what Dave Ramsey teaches, what all the coaches that I know teach. Um, and and the, the first one is that God owns it all. We don't have anything that, you know, God, God spoke it all into existence. Right. Um, it's all his it's all going back to him. So um, <laughs> it's up to us to just use effectively what he allows us to have by the principles that, that he lays out. And then those principles come after that, you know, saving money in the house of the wise or stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. Ah. Um, and so if you're saving money, then to, in order to save money, you have to live on less than you make, yep. which is a contentment issue. 
Godliness is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. And that doesn't mean you're not to have ambition, that you're not to you know, work hard and strive to build your business and, and get your promotions and everything. But I, again, it's, it's like, where is that in your priority list? Right. Um, right. Well, and if you can continue to make more, you can, you know, become more comfortable, but also give more. You can. Yep. Yep. The only, only the strong can help the weak. Yep. You know, if we're all dirt poor, <coughs> right. broke, it's hard to help each other. Right. Whereas, you know, the wealthy, godly people, oh my goodness, you know, and most of them probably you've never heard of. Right. Because they are giving billions of dollars. You know, yep. I think of like John Huntsman comes to mind, but um, yeah. yeah. And then debt, uh, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower slave to the lender. It's, there is nowhere in scripture where God has people has his people use debt to achieve his purposes. Mm. Um, it's not a sin. Debt is not a sin, but it's never spoken of positively. And it's always referred to basically as stupidity and slavery. Yeah, a slave to debt, right? You can't be free until you um, have your debts paid off or you can't feel free, I guess. And so, yeah. Makes sense. So how do you do all that? Well, you, you use a budget. Uh, agreed agreed between Our like budget. agreed between <laughs> your, your spouse and you on purpose cash flow plan it's a budget and that's in the bible too for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost whether he has enough to finish it lest after he's laid the foundation is not able to finish all who see it begin to mock him saying this man began to build and was not able to finish yep do a budget um, the four walls is, um, that, I think that's probably a Dave Ramsey-ism, four walls. It's basically, you take care of your household, you take care of the necessities of life first. Um, for anyone who doesn't provide for his relatives, especially for his immediate family, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So, and that's, you know, food, shelter, utilities, transportation, clothing. Um, so, um, and then giving, giving, it, it's not put last because it's last importance. In fact, when I help people set up their budget, it's giving's at the top. Yep. Um, but it, again, it kind of, stewardship programs in churches have kind of poisoned a lot of people's minds. Got it. Um, <laughs> because they just want their money. Oh, it's asking for money. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but, you know, we talk about the tithe and, and the scriptures about the tithe and you, what's the tithe? The tithe is 10% off the top to your local church. That's what supports your church and supports your pastor. <clears throat> and it's still not a salvation issue. So you know, I don't beat people over the head with it. I, I've run into people who they tithe faithfully no matter what, and we have a hard time making their budget work, and others that it's not as important to them, but I try to, you know, let them see you do have the money to give. Let's start increasing it and, and working towards the tithe. Yeah. But the point of giving is, is God wants us to become more like him. He made us in, in his image. We're, you know, unfortunately because of the fall sinful being so but so he's working to make us more perfect and more like him and he's a giver you know, john three sixteen. what did he give he gave his own time hey. yeah that's uh, some heavy duty given yeah <laughs> so i think we can give a few bucks here and there okay yep so, yeah and it's not always easy i know even for us like through the last two years with you know, shifting our income so much, um, writing that check every week sometimes. It, and I hate the feeling, like I hate that human feeling of like, oh God, like I want to give this, but it's going to be really tight, but then you give it and good things happen and he brings it back to you. And like, and it should be, it should be a kind of a form of worship. Yeah. Um, God loves a cheerful giver. It, it, it yep. should, I mean, it's not always because you, you've got all these things on your mind, but that's, 
That's the beauty of a budget. <laughs> the beauty of a budget <laughs> helps you see. Nope, we do have we have money. We have we're going to cover it all. Yep, it's yep. Right in there. We're good to go. Yeah. Yep. It's not always. I know um, some people. This comes a lot easier than others. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, right. But I think when you start doing all of these intentionally and you have the tools you know, to get a budget together and get that that that's the tool that's the decision making um, mechanism um, that gives you the piece to say here's how much we have here's where it's going to go you don't wonder anymore it may be really tight but at least you know you know it's yeah. like fear of the unknown is probably the worst thing yes Yep, so. I agree. I agree. Um, so this is an, an amazing layout. And I think I have a copy of this actually already. But um, when we post the um, podcast, I will put Bev's contact information in there. And if anybody wants a copy of this, feel free to reach out to her and she'll send it over. And then Bev, just to kind of wrap things up. Um, if somebody hasn't budgeted before, or they feel like they're drowning in debt, or they just don't know where to start. What do you recommend for them? And then I know there are some great apps. We use the Every Dollar um, app to do our budget. Mm -hmm. um, but can you make any recommendations for people to like find an easy way to sit down and create a budget? Um, and then like, like I said, like where do they start if they've never done it before? Because it is, I, I thought, I genuinely thought I was budgeting when I met Bev. Like yeah, most most people think <laughs> that a budget is knowing what my mortgage is and my electric bill and my car payment and that kind of thing. And that's those are elements of a budget, but it's not the whole budget. Um, so the the no matter what method you use, um, it all comes down to what you would do with a sheet of paper and it's month by month what's the upcoming month you know now we're what are we the 17th it's not too early to start planning your december budget what's coming in for the month of december salaries pension social security extra jobs gifts every source of any income tally it all up put it at the top of the page then down the page, you put categories and you start with those four walls and giving, you know, put your giving, then, you know, your, your housing, your rent or mortgage, food, um, essentials of life, start with the groceries, save eating out for later, like see how much we got, you know, um, yeah. utilities, yeah. car payment, gasoline, car insurance, blah, 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 blah. things, you know, so four walls, necessities of life, then obligations, which is probably debt pay <clears throat> debt payments, your credit card payment, your at least your minimum credit card payments. Yes. Um, and any other debts that you have that you have to pay. The rest is discretionary. Um, now, relatively speaking, you know, uh, is it discretionary? Is your cable bill discretionary? Yeah. Um, yeah. If, can, if I cancel everything and don't have internet and can't run my business, now that's a problem. Okay. Right. But do I need HBO and Showtime and all that other stuff? Okay. Exactly. So you just give every dollar an assignment, every dollar of that total income down to you spend it theoretically on paper on all those categories until there's nothing left. It's called a zero based budget because when you subtract all those from the income at the top, you get zero at the bottom. Yep. And then you stick to the plan. And do it with your partner, right? <laughs> and you do it as, as when you're married, you both have to agree on it. And there's going to be give and take. Yeah, you'll learn that like, you have different priorities. Like when Rob and I did this, I grew up on a farm. We didn't even have cable TV. So like not having TV for me is not a big deal. I, I, I don't watch it. Um, and I'm programmed in a way that I, it, I can't sit down for more than 30 minutes anyway, where he really enjoys watching his sports. And especially since we moved here from Arizona, he's a big Diamondback fan, 
they, so like to get rid of the package that showed those sports, it, that was hard on him. And so we had to meet in the middle and like, okay, well, if you want that, we're gonna have to give up from some other category. And it was, it was definitely, we had some money is finite and, yes. and you got to go month by month because every month is different. Yeah. Especially if you have your own business, like, oh, yeah. I mean, I never really know until the commission check hits my bank account, what it's going to be. I can give it a good estimate. Yeah. You know, oh, I, I remember those days. It's like, I knew when I was selling ads, it's like, if I collected the money, I knew that I sent that in, I knew what my commission would be, but sometimes they, the advertisers would send the money in directly and I didn't know whether they did or not. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, and we can do a whole nother podcast on that because that's. <laughs> I would love to, yeah, for, to help people. Cause a lot of people are doing the side hustles and um, I've got right. clients doing DoorDash like, like crazy. There are issues, people start doing that and they don't realize they're in their own business now yep. and they need to run it like a business yep um and set aside taxes and then all that kind of <laughs> stuff you know um yeah. but yeah it, as far as budgeting you can do it on pencil and paper but tracking it makes that very cumbersome because then you have to compare okay how much have i spent on groceries versus this so it does help to have a computer uh, an app a computer thing i i actually sell one on my website um, oh, it's a, a Google Sheets thing. is It's basically what I use with my clients. Oh, cool. Um, and I customize it for people and teach them how to use it. It doesn't include coaching. So I don't tell them, well, what your numbers, you know, let's talk about what your numbers should be. That's right. coaching. That's part of coaching. Um, okay. But teach them to use the tool. Um, yeah. but you know, there's every dollar there's YNAB, you need a budget. There's mint, you know, I, and I don't know a whole lot about all of them because I love my Google sheets method. Yeah, no, I'm going to check that out. Cause it, I mean, we are okay with the every dollar it works for us. It's, it's good, but I, I wouldn't mind having something else. And then like, I know some people that are going through this program that do still put the cash in the envelopes. Um, is that think um, you really need the discipline maybe? Uh, I, like <laughs> I'm kind of ambivalent on it because I've seen people abuse that as much as use it. It takes in a way more discipline because if you're walking around in your purse with cash in a groceries envelope wow. and an eating out envelope and a clothing envelope and a whatever, it's real easy to steal from Spend one it. to the yep. other. Yep. I can see that. So, um, some people use it quite well. We don't, I don't use it. I just say, you just get a receipt. I don't care how you pay. Um, I mean, don't be, you know, not credit cards, but debit card, cash, check right. online, whatever, but get a receipt, record every transaction. And you just, you get, you just get in the habit of get a receipt, no matter where you're at, no matter what you're buying, stick a gum, get a receipt. Yep. And that remind you keep That's it in one place and that reminds you to put it in the budget. Add up. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. good stuff, Bev. Thank you so much for joining me. And I feel like we talked for hours about this topic. It's so yeah, I'd love to come back and talk about, yeah, some of the, you know, like the independent contractor thing. Yeah. yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. I want to do a whole like money series. Maybe we'll do like a money month here coming up because um, between you and Kristen also, I, this was supposed to be a series, but Kristen, I can't get our, our times together right now, but, um, so I really appreciate you doing this. And especially like, as we head into the holidays and uh, as we head into the end of the year, like Bev said, like, this is the time to start thinking about next year and like, how are we going to budget? And, um, you know, if you guys can get through December and not put your Christmas presents on a credit card, like that's going to be magical for you. Because I remember the first year we did it, we'd always put on a credit card and then we just paid off, um, which was fine because we paid it off right away. But when we started our business, uh, that wasn't, we would have overspent on credit and then it would have taken us months to pay it off. And so we had our, the last three years, we've done Christmas with cash and um, it's just so nice. The transition from using a credit card to not using a credit card can be well, it can be a little tough. If you carry a balance, it can be a little tough at first. So, yeah. but Hey, I do free consultations. People go to my website, moneycoachbev.com. We can get on, you know, no obligation, an hour long, unpack your, all your issues, see what your priorities ought to be. 
see what you need help with. Um, it's guys, I encourage this so much. It is eye opening. Like I said, I thought I was good with money. I thought I had my stuff together and I met with Bev and she left and I was like, seriously sat there for probably 20 minutes. Like, huh, <laughs> I really have some work to do. And then it was, you know, talking with Rob and getting him on board with, you know, the, the different things. And he kind of had a negative, um, idea of Dave Ramsey and kind of what he what we would be he's like do we have to sell all of our stuff like I don't I don't think oh so much stuff the kids think they're next <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so um so it's been a journey and we're still on it and we still have our moments where we really stink at it and we have our moments where we feel like yes we got this and but I mean just in a few years we've come so far with our debts gone I mean we had really big medical bills last year because my daughter got sick. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Time. And we hit some stumbling blocks along the way, but because of this program and because we were following a budget and because we didn't have debt, um, it just, we're, we were able to get through it and still save and still get, still be in a place where we're not drowning and um, able, we were able to tithe along the way. So yeah, out yeah. Of budget. So all right. So thank you. I could talk to you forever. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh. And also tell tell just real quickly about your book. Bev is the published third oh, money book. Oh, um <laughs> well I am I have a, a chapter. You are don't make a face. <laughs> I have it up on hang on, where is it? I had it up. Let me get it up on my um I wrote a chapter in a book. Um more than most people. <laughs> that, well, I got connected with Kevin Cullis, who is a, um, a columnist for Town Hall and a um, good Christian man that uh, his passion is Christian entrepreneurialism um, and oh. business as mission and getting churches to recognize um, the importance of business and having good Christians in business. So this book was kind of an anthology of a lot of his friends and contacts who have similar passions. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of a disjointed thing. Every chapter is from a different person, kind of on a different topic, but all kind of under that umbrella. So I have a yeah. chapter that is called Wisdom, Work, Wealth, Find God's Purpose for Your Prosperity Through Side Gigs, Startups, and Entrepreneurship. Um, so, yeah, and I, I love it. And I don't have it. In, all my books are, we're temporarily living with my dad because we sold our house in the spring and we're building a house. So we're living with my dad and, and most of our stuff is packed up in its storage. I'm like, I don't know where my book is. <laughs> it's all packed <laughs> up in a box somewhere. I should have brought my copy with me. It's at home. Um, but I love this. As a Christian business owner, like we face, uh, you know, a lot of challenges, just like any entrepreneur. But then we've got our values and our faith that um, can make it easier, um, but also can make it more challenging because we look at things a little bit differently than our non Christian um, business part, you know counterparts um and so this book is just a really great read um for anybody who's you know pursuing um their own business so i wanted to make sure we mentioned that before i get off so now i promise you guys we are gonna end this podcast <laughs> hang on let me stop oh thank here. you so much you you're amazing and you know I'm i love a, probably you. a little better at zoom i'm gonna live on zoom so <laughs> all right so joshua 1 9 have i not commanded you be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks, Sam.